Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second talk here in Medien Theater. I hope you're well. Um, I would like you to ask uh, to consider becoming a troll. Uh, kitchen needs trolls, um, the whole venue is run by trolls, and as always, we don't have enough trolls. So I would like, I would ask you to consider becoming a troll, which is awesome. Now to the talk. Um, I just learned that radio sound is not a Denglish word or uh, a German word used in English context. It is an English word. Um, this is the, the telemetry device that hangs below a weather balloon that goes up into the atmosphere to, to collect data like temperature, humidity and all sorts of things. Um, he is Basjo. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, uh, he started um, getting getting into the field of of radio sounds um, by collecting them, and uh, ended up being a, a developer, professional developer for those types of radio sounds. Uh, he is talking about the protocol and all the things around. Um, please welcome Baz Joe. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Johannes and um, I will talk about how radio sound telemetry works. So um, I have, as previously heard, a lot to do with radio sounds. So um, this year's radio sound talk is going to focus more on the in-depth side of the communications engineering, how the telemetry works, and some things we need to know if we want to write our own decoders. So what's on the agenda for today is there will be short introduction uh, into radio sounds as well. And if we want to talk about telemetry, and then I think it's good to give a little bit of a radio and modulation primer because I think not all of you are, um, have a foundation in communications engineering. Then I want to talk about how it all started and how I um, got to work with radio sound telemetry and ended up doing what I do. Then we will look into two radio sound types in particular, the Weissler RS41 radio sound, which is used in Germany, and the Grohr DFM radio sound, which is used in the United States and some other territories as well. Um, after we discuss those telemetry formats, then we'll look a little bit more into how we can decode them and how we can um, say whether our decoder is any good. So a little bit of a disclaimer. Yeah, I work with radio sounds for a living. Uh, no, I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer here. So all that I'm talking about is stuff that I did in my free time, um, mainly before I joined my current employer, and also some research that I do um, with my research affiliation. Receiving and decoding radio sounds might not be legal where you live. Um, please check your own legislation where you live, and transmission in this band is most certainly not, so please don't transmit on radio sound frequencies. Also, these things that I'm going to present here were in large part not discovered by myself. There are a lot more knowledgeable people than me. Uh, for example, Zylog 80, which is also known as RS1792, he's very knowledgeable on the topic. Hans, Hansi, Rolf, and a lot of other ones as well. So um, please pay these guys uh, on the minimum as much respect as you may do me for giving this talk. So a little bit on a, of a radio sound primer. So I did a talk on this topic last year as well, so I'm going to keep it fairly short. Radio sounds are the measurement devices which fly aloft weather balloons. So um, those measurement devices are disposable because you don't know where the weather balloon ends up landing. Um, and they measure something we call PTU data in the industry, that's short for pressure, temperature and humidity. Um, and also wind data, so how where the balloon is flying and where it is drifting, so how the wind must be in this uh, part of the atmosphere. And sometimes external data from external instruments is collected via uh, a protocol called X-data as well. They are very lightweight and battery operated, usually using lithium primary batteries. 
and they are a backbone to upper troposphere, lower stratosphere weather, weather measurements. So they are heavily used for numeric weather prediction, and WP, and also climatology. There are around 1,000 launch sites that report to the uh, WMO's um, reporting network, each performing about one to four launches per day. There are also some special uses for, for example, artillery ranges, research applications, and a lot more. Uh, there are two large manufacturers, Weissala and Gro, on the market, and a few smaller ones as well. So, as I previously said, uh, there are some other radio sound talks. Um, there is a great talk uh, from Mark Jessop and Michaela Wheeler from uh, the Australian Linux conference from 2019. And um, my talk from last year about radio sounds is closely um, on the same track as this talk, let's say. So choose your own adventure whether you prefer English or German talks. So, I mean, radio sound telemetry, it's a very, let's say, niche or obscure topic. Um, I'm glad that so many came here to, in this early hour and in a foreign language talk to learn about this. But wh why should I even care? Even if I'm into radio sounds and I enjoy hunting radio sounds, I mean, we got those TT Go boards and I just need to turn it on, tune in the right frequency and it says everything right here. It's, uh, that's a coordinates where I need to go to collect this radio sound and why do I need to know how the, how the telemetry format works? And, um, Excuse for the for the for the German article that I'm going to show here um, that I read last week when doing the preparations for this talk. It's uh, about some residents in a small German municipality who got a little bit scared of those pesky 5G towers that uh, the T-Mobile wanted to put there, and it had all the let's say checkbox marks of such articles like health risks of 5G are totally unknown particularly feared a birth defect in, in young, young animals of a nearby farm and children. And I find particularly funny, the protests were initiated by the managing director of a consulting firm that is responsible for implementing digital technology in schools within the county. But ask yourself, like, radio sound telemetry is a very, very simple topic, but let's put it to 5G. Uh, who of you can explain how 5G works? And who of you has the tools at home to prove that 5G is not some kind of evil wizardry and that there is some wizard enchanting all the iPhones and some wizard exploded, uh, um, employed at Huawei enchanting all the cell towers? Like, who can prove that? And can you blame people who are not as technically knowledgeable to have a fear of those wizards? And I think that's why we really need to approach this topic on a very basic level. I think radio telemetry is a very basic level. And with this knowledge, we can prove that all those technologies, they are just incremental small changes from technology that's decades old. And if we understand at least a little bit about the basics, then um, we can make sure that people don't think that this is wizardry, but in, in fact understand how it is science and how the science work and how they, how they can prove it for themselves with accessible technology. And I want to do a little bit in this regard with this talk as well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, radio and modulation. So why do we need modulation in the first place? Uh, there was a great talk about software-defined radio yesterday. Um, I think maybe some of you saw it as well. It's also on, on the streaming, but unfortunately it's in Germany for the international viewers. And um, there, some reasoning was given with the principle of the superheterodyne receiver. I thought about including this one as well, but I felt against it, and that was a good decision because it was already talked about yesterday. So I want to give a little bit of a different explanation, which is like a f fundamental explanation of the principle. So imagine you want to transmit some information wirelessly. It can be some Let's say it's an, some analog information, maybe some, some voice signal, maybe just the, the audio transmission uh, from the wireless microphone or so on. Why don't you just transmit it in the baseband? Just uh, audio is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Just use these electromagnetic waves. So first problem is um, the longer the waves, the more difficult to implement the technology gets, very large um, 
wavelengths is only used for some niche application because it's very difficult to implement. But also think about it. If there's talks going on here and on the, on the, in the other venues as well, and everyone would use this baseband frequency band, then we could only transmit one channel of audio and we couldn't transmit any more than one signal as far as the signal is propagating. So we need some sort of bringing a signal into a different frequency band. And this is what modulation does. So modulation has two signals, the carrier signal and the, the signal that we want to use. Um, and that is quite an overused picture that I put here. You can see an analog signal at the top, that is the data that we want to transmit. And there are some two common types of modulation where we use a different uh, wave that's called the carrier. It has the higher frequency that you see here. And we modulate the signal on top of the carrier. So with AM or amplitude modulation, we modulate the amplitude of the signal. So um, we increase the intensity when we want to transmit higher values and we decrease it when we want to transmit lower values. And with frequency modulation, we increase the frequency of the signal when we want to transmit um, higher values and decrease the frequency when we want to transmit lower values. And one thing that you need to understand here is that um, each frequency with frequency modulation is um, transmitting a certain amplitude of the signal and not a frequency. So that is uh, something that I confused at least initially. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. So of course um, we're all digital now so um, we can look at frequency shift keying as a special case of frequency modulation for binary data. So now we have binary data and we still have our carrier signal, but now we have two distinct frequencies. Uh, one is for the lower amplitude, one is for the higher amplitude, and we just switch those two frequencies and that way we can encode the data. So we can put this into some, um, some formulas as well. So we have the frequency deviation of delta, which is a key component to determine the occupied bandwidth, and it can be expressed as the difference between the two transmit frequencies, so um, the two frequency you see, frequencies you see in the, in the bottom graph. And you have the carrier frequency, which is the middle frequency. And some important thing to note is that the frequency deviation and the frequency of the, of the symbols, so the individual ones and zeros, um, is not necessarily um, constrained in like a, a hard constraint. So you can choose those two, of course, taking into account some parameters, but you have a modulation index that is the, um, the quotient of these two values. And you can choose these modulation, this modulation index within some certain bounds. Um, why do I talk about symbols here and not bits? I mean, obviously there are ones and zeros and this is called bit and not symbol. Um, it's a little bit like with the serial transmissions where you talk about baud rate and not bit rate. Um, so in the simple case of two FSK where you just have two, two, um, two frequencies, um, one bit is equal to one symbol because you can only encode uh, one bit with each symbol because you only have two symbols. But um, with some telemetry we will look at later that we can only encode half a bit with each uh, symbol. Um, so, or otherwise, the other way around. We'll look into this in a, little bit, a little bit later on. So, how did it all get started? Like, in 2018 I did my bachelor's thesis on atmospheric measurements and somewhere I stumbled across those, those radio sounds and at the time, I didn't have a Baofeng radio, I think, so I ordered one of eBay or Amazon and tuned into the radio sound channels. I put out my antenna and I heard for the first time those radio sound sounds. Uh, I didn't include it in the presentation, but on Sigitwiti there are some uh, example signals that you can listen to. And um, yeah, it sounds a little bit like an uh, old fax machine or... Um, or um, um, analog, analog modulation. And then there's a well-known software tool chain. So, of course, radio sound enthusiasts use the RTL-SDR, software-defined radio, as well. And 
On Windows, the software to go with is SDR Sharp. So you tune into the radio sound frequency with your SDR Sharp and you get an audio signal. So we, I said earlier that FSK is just a special case of frequency modulation. So you just use a frequency demodulator in the right, um, in the right bandwidth domain. So 12 kilohertz usually for radio sound signals and you get out an audio signal. And then you can use a virtual loopback interface to pipe this audio signal back into your machine. And connect some sort of software to it. And the software which visualizes radio sound telemetry for RS-41, at least the nicest, the nicest is RS-41 tracker. So I plugged in my RS-41 tracker, I set up the loopback interface and right here, all the decoded data, that's so nice. But then I also wanted to hunt down those radio sounds and initially um, I found the RS-41 radio sounds and I took a closer look into them and I also learned a little bit about the hardware. So I just want to go about this just very briefly. Um, the most interesting part for us here is that we have an STM32 microcontroller and an integrated radio transmitter, a Scilab Psi 432. And who joined me with my last talk about hardware reverse engineering knows that step number one is reconnaissance. So I took a look into the data sheet and I found like some interesting stuff, some not so interesting stuff, uh, some regulatory stuff, but also some interesting information about the transmission. So I found a peak to peak deviation 4.8 kilohertz and a data downlink of 4,800 bits per second so initial gas modulation index will be one. Um, so that gives the parameters that you can set on your SDR sharp. So then I thought, I mean, it's audio data. So let's have a look into this audio data. I want to know how we come from this step where we have some FM demodulated baseband data to this step. And that's what the, the first part of this presentation will focus on. So um, I used everyone's favorite software for engineering or for working with audio signals, made Tentacle Proud and used Audacity. So this is a screenshot that I used for my GitHub repository uh, where I explain all this stuff, uh, where you can see there are some ones and zeros, obviously, and they are not so pretty, but I guess we can work with them. And if you um, would listen to the RS-41 telemetry, then you would see that it's about 500 millisecond long frames that are every second. And there's also a short beep in front of every frame. And this is the preamble. So we take a look at where does the data start. And we see a high frequency part of the data here. That's the preamble. And the filter from the FMD modulator needs a little bit of time to settle that there is a signal now. So the nice thing when you have telemetry that starts with a preamble is that you n know where you need to start looking for a header and where all the telemetry, the data actually starts. So we can take a look in the data sheet of the transmitter. Maybe we learn something about the protocol that is used there. So um, this transmitter is actually NRND, so that's where there's the gray text on top of it. We have a preamble, which is not optional. It needs to be between 1 and 512 bytes. We have a sync word, which is also not optional. It needs to be between one and four bytes. And we have data and everything else, the TX header packet lengths and TRC is optional. So let's look whether we can find this sync word. And um, I will refer to this as a header. So behold, we find a header. And um, we can see this is little endian and it uses um, a non-intuitive byte order. So this here is the first nibble, it's a one, and then we have a zero, then we have a B, then we have six, C and an A, one and a one. And I was lucky then because I already know what the correct header should be, because as I said, some reverse engineering had already been done, but it was not very well documented. So I looked into the code and I found that out of RS 1729's decoder, uh, this should be a different hex value. But there's a catch here. The whole um, transmission is XOR scrambled. So there is an XOR mask. Um, I think the XOR mask is fairly static within the transmitter IC. And there's a, 
PN9 generator and you can set an initial value, but there's only a certain number of combinations, so you can get to the XOR mask fairly quickly. But why there's an why is there an XOR mask? I mean, does they want to um, make it a little bit harder for us? Do they don't think that we can figure out how the XOR mask work? No, it's to make sure that there is always, even if there's only a transmissions of, transmission of steady ones or zeros, that there are always enough sign changes in the signal. Because when you consider this signal analog, it needs to have a certain frequency, for example, to pass through uh, some filters, or maybe you want to sync your clock to the clock of the signal, so you want to have a lot of sign changes in the signal. And that's why you scramble with an XOR mask, so then you make sure that even if you have a long stream of ones or zeros, you always get enough sign changes. So one thing that I need to talk about is there are different variants of the RS-41, different telemetry formats. There are three models of RS-41 that are relevant to us. There is the SG variant that does not have a barometric pressure sensor. There is the SGP variant that has a barometric pressure sensor. And there is the SGM variant that has the ability to send encrypted data and also to send data at a later time. So each frame contains two actual data frames. And the conventional RS-41s also have the possibility in X, data frame, in X data mode to transmit longer frames as well. There's also the RS-41D model, but it uses a different frequency and it's continuously transmitting and we don't want to look at this. So, once we look at the data that comes after our header, we find something like this. So, I wrote our header here as the first, um, first four bits, already XRD scrambled, and then we have some sort of protocol structure. Th so, the first 48 bytes in the transmission is actually error correction data. It's the parity part of a Reed solomon code. Um, this is an interleaved Reed solomon code, so there are two uh, read Solomon code words and every, I think, second bit or second byte, not sure here, is uh, belonging to a different uh, read Solomon code word. And this is to increase the length of uh, burst errors that this code can correct. After this, there's a single byte that indicates whether this is a long frame, for example, for the encrypted dual frame mode or for the X data mode, or whether this is a standard frame. And that's, this is 0F or F0. I suspect this is so even if there's a corruption in one bit, you have still the other bits to indicate which frame length this is, because this is critical to understanding the frame. <coughs> and then there is, a, there is a variable amount of, let's say, fields. And each field starts with a, a unique ID. Uh, the first field is 79 then the length of the field in byte, because fields can have a variable length, then the data, and at the end there's a CRC16 checksum. And for a standard RS-41, there are, uh, I think, five fields that we really need to look into, and also just a buffer to fill up some empty space. I don't want to go through all the um, all the data that's encoded here individually, but I want to point out some things. So the status field encodes some information on the general status of the radio sound, so you can see the frame number, which is also coinciding with the seconds since the radio sound was turned on or started the transmission, because there's one frame every second. There's also the serial number, and this is just uh, eight character long ASCII string, battery voltage, and there are then some field, bit fields that indicate in which mode the radio sound is transmitting. Also, there is some more information on, um, and let's say, engineering data. So, uh, reference temperatures or the um, PWM of the humidity sensor heating, transmit power, and so on. And there is some important thing that I'll come to later. There's also the subframe. Then we have the measurement block, and in the measurement block, the sound sends the actual measurement values, so the pressure, temperature, and humidity. But these don't really look like physical units, and they are not. They are raw ADC values, and like they are not using the internal ADC of the STM32 here. They're using a completely custom ADC implementation. So these are very raw engineering data, and you can see that there are um, three values for each 
measurements. So there is a temperature measurement for the main temperature sensor and for the uh, humidity temperature sensor, but then there are two references, a high, uh, I'm just getting a little bit behind my, be, um, in front of myself, so it's a high reference and a low reference. And the same is for the capacitive measurements as well, for the humidity and for the pressure. And there's also, thankfully, it's nicely encoded the temperature of the pressure sensor module. And in case you don't have a physical pressure sensor fitted, uh, the pressure is just blank. Also interesting is the GPS info, because Radio sound hunters, they want to hunt the radio sound, so they are more interested in the GPS than they are in the PTU values. So we have the GPS time, we have some parameters on the fix and also some parameters on the satellite that the radio sound is receiving. And quite unusually, a raw GPS data section. So it turns out Weissala actually has their own uh, differential GPS algorithm and they need the raw pseudo ranges and Doppler shifts. So I just go a little bit back, you can see like almost a third of the, of the whole frame is taken up by this GPS raw data, all the pseudo ranges and Doppler shifts. Um, but we don't really need that because in the next field we already also get a nice GPS fix. It's ECEF and not that long, but a few lines of code will take care of that and you just need to do a little bit of coordinate, coordinate transformations and also some accuracy estimates as well. I don't know why I have two of these slides. <laughs> so what is the information that we want to take out of this? Obviously, like the GPS fix is the most important information because we want to find the radio sound. Also, the serial number is for people who um, want to visualize the radio sounds on nice internet sites like sondihub.org. Uh, they want to know the unique serial number because they don't like it if there are two radio sounds with the same serial because they will have the same track. So it's very important that if there's a unique serial number somewhere encoded in the transmission that we find it out. Also, the RS-41 has some timers, a kill timer and a burst timer. So the kill timer activates from the moment that the radio sound is launched and the burst timer from the moment that the balloon bursts. And after a certain amount of time, that this is defined within these timers, the radio sound will turn off itself to free the frequency if there's not enough frequencies available. And obviously, if there's a kill timer, then you need to be at the radio sound landing site before the kill timer activates in order to get the signal. Also, like the engineering data, battery voltage runtime is important as well. But the PTU data, I mean, it's nice to know how warm it is and what the humidity is, but I mean, we are no meteorologists. We just want to get the radio sounds right. And I want to take you on a small tangent here and want to tell you a little bit about the Gruan project. The Gruan project is the reference upper air network of the WMO, so the World Meteorological Organization. And it provides the reference data, for example, for research, climatology and satellite calibration. So very important stuff. And they use radio sounds. They have high requirements for their stations and the radio sound that will, they will use as well. And they develop something they call Gruan data products for each instrument they want to use. Because they figured out that there's a lot of black box stuff going on with all these meteorological instruments and time has shown that it's not always good to trust manufacturers because if they find out that there's a problem with their data then maybe 20 years of climatology uh, of data relevant for climatology is biased and we don't really know how to correct it. So it's very important that we know how this data is being made. So the Gruan data product is open source, manufacturer independent, peer reviewed and provides a measurement error. These are the criteria for a data product to be considered a Gruan data product. And that sounds quite nice for what we in general want to do, like open source sounds nice, manuf manufacturer independent sounds nice, that's I mean fairly close to what we do. Um, but we need to know that this is like the next step after this engineering data. If you know where the sound is in time and space, you don't really know how the wind is there because there's a pendulum motion effect and you need to correct for this pendulum, pendulum motion effect. If you know how warm the temperature sensor on top of the radio sound is, you don't really know how warm the air is in the vicinity of this temperature sensor because this temperature sensor may be heated up by radiation or it might be cooled by evaporation if it just passed through a cloud. And you don't really know 
what the humidity is because the humidity sensor may experience uh, time lag phenomena where it doesn't change the water the water vapor within the uh, that is the water that is trapped within the humidity sensor can't escape so quickly as the external ambient values change so this is really what the gruan project is after so they use the physical ptu values that the manufacturer gives them and then they do this kind of correction um, with the gruan criteria and this is nice for us because if we have the physical PTU values then we get for free with the Gruan project basically a high reference open source data product that we can use. And also I mean you saw those raw engineering values. I mean they're not really physical PTU values and who know who knows what sort of magic is going on in coming from these ADC values to physical temperature, pressure and humidity values and if maybe something co could go wrong there, for example, with the calibration data or so on. So that's an external layer of security added to what those guys are doing, doing with Gruan as well. So for the next thing, we need to look a little bit on how Weissala does their decoding. Um, and they do the uh, physical um, they do the physical um, demodulation and the decoding, just as I showed you as well. And that's the binary, binary telemetry you see on the bottom left. They also use some sort of non-volatile memory data and this is the NVM data you see on the, on the top left. And then they do the raw PTU calculation and something drops out of there that's called a raw PTU.xml file. And from that the data product is calculated and the reports and messages are generated. And Gruan attaches to the center block, so they do their own data product calculation. But they still use the raw PTU values as their input. So if we could show that the raw PTU values that we can get with our open source approach and the decoding we have done so far is as good as the raw PTU values, then we can make a completely open source data product. So if we would implement the RS41 Gruan data product ourselves, I mean it should be open source, but the documentation is not really yet released, but they're working on it, and we figure out how to calculate the raw PTU values with the same accuracy, then we would have a completely open source RS41 data product. And I mean that's not something out of the blue. The other radio sounds that are Gruan certified mainly are completely open source. So the Gruan data product uh, uses those engineering values. So that's maybe just something that's special with this sort of radio sound. And luckily some firmware reverse engineering happened. So in 2019 there was a new EU reverse engineering protection law. In 2022 the readout protection of the STM32 F100 was broken. And then some people started to sending, sending me binaries. But I'm not really that proficient with STM32 assembly, so I couldn't help them. But then some TXT files started to go around the interwebs. And it turned out that the sound calculates the PTU values internally as well. And if you think about it, that makes sense because the sound has a heated humidity sensor. And in order to know how much the humidity sensor needs to be heated, the sound needs to know the physical values as well. And there's a hidden service menu and there's a hidden UART machine to machine interface. Just a little bit more on that one later, sorry. Um, but first we need to know, look a little bit into the second block, that's the NVM transmission. So when you are a legitimate user of the radio sound, um, you have an NFC readout device and it reads out the NF non-volatile memory data directly out of the radio sound. But it turns out, uh, and also the non-volatile memory contains all the con configuration, calibration data and status variables. So all the other stuff that we're interested on that's not really part of the telemetry itself. It's 800 bytes long and it turns out the sound transmits it as the subframe over 50 individual frames. So we just need to, con uh, we just need to collect 50 consecutive radio sound frames and then we got the NVM data ourselves, luckily. And there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, a lot of engineering stuff, but also here the calibration values, um, humidity matrix calibration values and so on that we need to know to make use of the uh, discovered algorithms. Also just a little bit about the service menu. You can do a lot of stuff in here 
and it's really nice. That's all I'm going to say about it for now. But just make sure that, I mean, you can change the registers of the transmission chip using the service menu. But obviously, if you turn on the radio sound, use those registers to change the transmission of the sound to the amateur frequency band. It's not a, not a good idea to start the radio sound like this, because if it resets, then it will be back to the original frequency. And you don't want that, so don't do that, please. Also, there's one patent that helps as well because it has uh, some formula that is important for the humidity calculation as well in it. But this also means that our initial plan to make a completely open source decoding tool chain is now gone because this formula is patented. So we know it, but we can't use it. Don't know whether that really helps, but it's nice to have, I guess, the formula. So if we use those formulas and this data, we still have the question, is that PTU data any good? So can we use it? And that's what I looked into a little bit more detail um, while I was doing research at my university. So we did a conference paper on that. And it turns out that in general, yeah, the temperature values, they are really close. So we're just um, like, you have here a histogram that shows the number of uh, occurrences in, or the number of data points in a data set that consisted, I think, about, about 20 radio sound launches from a, from a German institution. Uh, that thankfully shared their data with us and it's really close so it's just like 50 millikelvins low and I just put the data sheet values here the combined uncertainty and sounding here just as a reference so uh, sorry the, f the first one on top is the pressure it's just about uh, 0 0.05 hectopascals so I uh, don't want to transfer transform that in pascals right now. But the pressure is spec to 1 hectopascals and we're well below that. The temperature is spec to 0 0.4 Kelvin and I think we're within like 50 millikelvins here. And the humidity is spec at around 4% RH. And if we use this, uh, this patented formula, then we find that we are generally with a lot of values, we are pretty close, but we have some outliers that are up to 2% um, difference. So that would add like half of the manufacturer specified uncertainty on top of that and that's not really something that we want to have. So the humidity it still needs a little bit of work but in general you can show that the uh, raw PTU data that we get out of the of the Weisseler approach is the same that we can get with our own formulas. Yeah and that's basically the first part about RS41 telemetry. Now we want to look into um, Grau DFM telemetry. And to do that, we need to go back to the 1980s when radio sound still looked something like this. This is the Weissala RS80 radio sound. It's the pre pre predecessor of the current radio sound, I think. And it did not use any of this. It has a completely analog transmission. So, how those kind of radio sounds worked is that you had one transmitter, an analog transmitter, and you still had a you still had some sort of a data converter. So you had a um, an oscillator where the frequency determining element was the measurement element. So the frequency of this transmitter changed according to the physical values, and then you used this analog frequency to modulate the transmitter. So you really got an analog frequency modulated on the transmission frequency that was respective of the data that you wanted to transmit. And of course you only have one transmitter but you have a lot of sensors that you want to transmit so you use a digital switch to just turn around those. Um, if you see some really old pictures of radio sounds they sometimes have like a little spinning wheel that's driven by wind. That's an analog switch. So as this wheel spins and while the radio sound flies it switches the different um, the different um, capacitors or resistors in circuit with a transmitter. So you can construct this electromechanically as well. And the DFM telemetry or the DFM radio sound format, the first DFM radio sound was the DFM 90 in 1990. It was the first completely digital radio sound. So it had an ADC, it digitized all the values and it, send it, it sends out digital frames. But it still closely resembles how the telemetry of those old radio sounds worked. So you still have comparatively short frames, only 224 milliseconds long, and each frame only consists of the sensor data of a single frame. 
uh, of a single sensor, sorry. Um, so that's quite different to what we saw with the RS41, which used one second frames. Also just uh, how looks the DFM17 from the inside. That's just a picture from the internet I took. Um, and you can see it's basically identical. So it has an STM32 microcontroller as well. It has um, a pretty similar Scilabs chip. And it's interesting that this Scilabs chip really is the best fit for radio sounds. So I think more than half of all the radio sounds you can buy use one of those two Scilabs transmitter chips. Um, you can also compare the telemetry information. So um, you can see that the complete measurement cycle is four times 224 milliseconds, so 896 milliseconds for the TU data for the DFM17. And of course, the GPS fix comes every one second, so it's one second for the wind. Frequency range is the same, modulation is the same. Um, Graw has an advantage here because they only have a baud rate of 2500 baud, but use a similar frequency deviation, so you got a higher modulation index, and that generally helps with, with decoding the radio sound data. But with the lower baud rate comes a lower bit rate, and Graw uses um, a Manchester decoding or a two-phase, uh, two-state um, phase shift keying as a line coding here as well, so the bit rate is only half of that, 1250 bits per second. Frame size of a single frame is only 35 bytes, and um, Graw uses a different sort of error correction that is not as efficient. So the data rate is generally much lower, but on the opposite, uh, DFM data is much easier to receive than RS41 data because of all the, um, the higher margins that you have here. DFM decoding workflow, I have some nicer pictures of that because that's already also part of my, of my master's thesis, so I prepared some nice pictures for that one as well that I can recycle here. Uh, you have the raw FSK demodulated data, so a baseband stream just as we had with the DFM as well, uh, sorry, the RS41 as well. And you, um, this consists of 560 half symbols. Because you have the Manchester line code, every two half symbols, two following half symbols are decoded as one symbol. So then you do the Manchester decoding, two half symbols get you, gives you one bit, and then you have 560 divided by two bits, and then you can make bytes out of these. And you've got some really nice even numbers here. Uh, you got a two byte header, seven bytes for the sensor, and that's like what I said to you earlier, like just the sensor that's switched between those frames. But on, at some later stage, like GPS was invented, and there was still some place in this, some space in these frames that was previously not used because the old microcontrollers couldn't transmit and measure at the same time. So there was just like a bunch of, I, think, I, don't, I don't know really, zeros or ones sent during this time. So you still have 26 bytes that you can use for data or GPS values in here. Um, then there's a step for the interleaving and error correction. It's only a Hamming code used here, so um, to be able to still have some amount of burst errors that you can correct, um, there's interleaving going on. So that way I think it's um, 13 bits burst errors for the, um, for the data fields. Not really sure. It's in the documentation, in the open source documentation. Um, and from this intermediate form, then you can construct a data frame. And this is really what we are looking into in a little bit. So for the, from the seven byte sensor values, you make a three byte sensor field and one nibble for a sensor ID because you want to know which sensor is being transmitted. And for the data fields, you know, from the 13 bytes, you make six data bytes and one nibble for the ID but the ID is in the back, not in the front. And when you accumulate enough frames, like four frames for the PTU data set, plus some more frames for the alternating fields, and seven or eight data fields for the GNSS data, then you get a complete PTU plus GNSS data set. So after the last step, when we have those data frames decoded, how does it look like? I think it's very abstract at this point. So let's just look at a snippet of data at this point. So every frame consists of a sensor field and two data fields. 
And with the sensor field, you need to look in the first nibble to see the ID. So you have sensor ID 0, 1, 2, 3. 0, 1, 2, 4. 0, 1, 2, 5. 0, 1, 2, 6. So the fourth sensor field is an alternating sensor field where there's alternating values being sent. And for the data fields, you look at the last nibble. So this is ID 6, 7, 8, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. But because uh, 224 does not share a common denominator with uh, one second interval, sometimes you have seven data fields, sometimes you have eight, and in case there's no data available, you also sometimes have an empty data field. So by um, accumulating enough of these data, um, you can construct a whole, um, a whole telemetry frame. So what do these sensors actually mean? Like you have a value for temperature, humidity, humidity temperature, and then some sort of configuration. So this is just an exemplary sensor configuration. The general type of telemetry stayed the same all the way since the 90s, and so there's a lot of different configurations of the different sensors. Um, and you can do the same for the, for the data configuration as well. And this is all stuff that is on GitHub in the relevant decoders as well. So just one thing that comes up a lot with DFM radio sound telemetry that I want to um, mention as well. As far as the telemetry concerned, um, DFM radio sound serials still follow the same um, coding of the serial year, year, and then an ongoing number as it was previously. But now the product serial additionally features the date of manufacture. Also, there is no encoding of the radio sound type within the telemetry. So you saw earlier for the, R for the RS41 in the subframe, there was a clear identification in ASCII what sort of RS41 it is. This is not the case with the DFM radio sound. So there are some hints. There's the polarity of the signal because different generations of radio sound use a different polarity. There's also the sensor configuration, so the number of alternating or fixed sensors. And there's the data structure within the sensors. So does it look like an INT16? Does it look like ASCII, basically? Most importantly, it should be taken into account where the radio sound launched from. So if you found a radio sound of a particular type from a certain station, and you now have a radio sound in the air that has the same telemetry format, then it's likely that it will be the same radio sound. But if you just see on Sondi Hub that it is identified as a DFM09, maybe, doesn't necessarily say that it's a DFM09. It may be a different type of radio sound. Because there is some guessing going on with the decoders, but there's no way to say for sure with this protocol. So now I just want to use the last few minutes to um, talk a little bit about baseband decoders. So uh, what I showed you um, at the beginning, the Audacity data, so just the FM demodulated baseband stream, how can you decode it? And a little bit of a disclaimer, we will only take a look at analog baseband data as an input, which is already FM demodulated. Direct, so IQ, FSK demodulation can have some advantages, but they are mostly not about what radio sound amateurs or radio sound hunters care about the sensitivity, but more like frequency stability and so on. Um, in regards to sensitivity, you can like, get a little bit more, of out, more out of it, but not that much. Um, getting the highest decoder sensitivity is not always the prime objective, and it's a starting point because um, like in the 1980s and 90s, this was all you had. You had your... Um, your demodulation output on your analog radio, and you could put this into a sound card on a, on a PC and work with it. So that's what I did for my master's thesis. Previously, we had a decoder architecture that was um, based on a modified Costas loop. So it did a full clock recovery. Um, and when once the clock was recovered, then it did an integrate and dump on the um, on the um, passband filtered data, and then you don't know which Manchester polarity you get, so you need to look into both variants, so you don't know where your Manchester symbol starts, if, it's, if you're in the middle or in your, if you're in the start of the Manchester symbol. So um, you need to decode change 
chains from this point on um, and you just add up the Manchester symbols and um, if that way you can see if you got a valid Manchester symbol or not and then you can correlate like literally with the um, with the literal header OX45 CF to see whether you found a frame or not and depending on whether you got the right or the wrong um, Manchester polarity, uh, not polarity, like the part where you are in the, in the Manchester symbol, uh, the even or the odd decoder will output the right data. And that was quite problematic because um, this is a really an, an analog implementation that's brought into the digital domain. And we worked a little bit with the Radiosond um, community and we made this much more similar to what uh, amateur decoders already used. So the new decoder architecture just uses a, a low pass filter at first and we, then we just um, use the sample rate of the signal to calculate two masks, the header mask and the symbol mask. And then we just do a continuous cross correlation of the mask that we calculated previously and do a peak detection on it and in case we found the header, then there will be a strong signal with the peak detection. And then we found basically the signal. This works, of course, best if there's long headers. Because if you have long headers, then you have a stronger correlation between the header and the data. So that sort of architecture is really targeted to longer headers. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. But you can throw more calculating power at it and then it's... Um, it's no big deal. And then you can do uh, use the symbol mask and do uh, another cross correlation that you just evaluate at the peak points you, you already know and quantize that and then you have your detected frames. So where you previously could only do the correlation at just the numeric phase where you just correlate two binary numbers, you can now due to the um, the yeah the computing power computer power increase and so on, you can do a correlation in the stream as well. And that way you don't need any clock recovery because you say, like my transmitter clock, it's stable enough that during the, um, the duration of a frame it will not drift more than, let's say, a tenth of a symbol away. That's of course the, um, the thing that needs to be there. But we now have those digital transmitters, digital receivers, and they are fairly good at it. So what can we make out of this? Um, DSP SV module here in this graph is the uh, decoder that was previously in use. I implemented the principle myself and already got a little bit of a improvement. And the header correlation decoder is the decoder I showed you last. So what you see here is the signal to noise ratio of a baseband signal, a generated baseband signal, and uh, gross packet error rate. That means you have two steps that you need to consider here. First you have the um, packet detection. So is the header recognized with this method? But then if the header is recognized, you may not have sufficient uh, energy in the bits to be able to decode the field. So you may all you may have some bit errors as well. So um, my metric of uh, gross PER takes into account the frames that are unusu unusable because they were missed or that are unusable because they got too many bit errors. And you can see that uh, there's almost a 3 dB improvement between uh, those decoders and the bit error rate as well because you don't have this clock recovery step that adds additional clock jitter in the recovery but you're looking at the at the um, at the limits between the the bits directly, and the bit clock is usually more stable than the recovered bit clock. Also, uh, the folks over at Radiosond AutoRx they did some comparison beyond Radiosonds, and this is using two different sorts of uh, demodulation types. So uh, there's an FSK demodulator that was written specifically for this purpose, but it's just a 2FSK uh, demodulator. And there's also the approach that I just showed you. So there's using RTL-FM as an FM demodulator and then piping this output signal 
into the um, baseband decoder just like I did. And generally for most of the radio sound type, no, now they use the FSK demodulator because as I said, it has advantages when you have frequency offsets. There's also a comparison between the FSK and FM demodulators, but it requires a little bit more in-depth analysis, so I don't put it here. You can look it up yourself. Um, it's all on GitHub. So you can see that the required um, energy, bit energy um, per noise for 50% packet error rate is uh, much lower with the DFM radio sound than with the RS-41 radio sound, and that's to all, due to all the overhead in the uh, protocol that I showed you earlier. Also, just um, as prior to last slide, comparing different testing methods. So what I did here was I used simulated baseband data with variable signal to noise ratio. And that's good if you're comparing one decoder to another and just looking at the algorithmic implementation. Um, then there's also the variant of using simulated or complex baseband data with a variable um, EB over N0. And this is good if you're comparing one transmission scheme to another because EB over N0 is basically um, the variant of um, comparing different, um, different bandwidth requirements from different modulation schemes. But both of these don't account for the actual radio receiver and its problems. So if you want to take a look into the whole receiving chain, then you um, still need to take a look into your whole receiving chain. And um, what I found is that it's usually best to uh, do the real testing, pipe real analog data or real data through the decoder and the whole decoding chain and look how it performs. Um, and this also takes into account all the non-linearities into the receivers and all the different testing scenarios that you might have. So what I found is that um, if you really have a, a well-defined test case, then the generated data is good, but it can't replace uh, real-life data, which is unfortunately much harder to get. Also, all I said here is uh, published on, on GitHub or um, uh, published in the literature as well. And if you have any questions, then don't hesitate to contact me. I think we have time for a little bit of questions. Thank you very much. This was super interesting. We have four minutes. So one question. Hi, good morning. Many thanks for the interesting talk. Um, what is your take? Do you expect to be radio sound data to be encrypted in the future? Or will we amateurs still be able to receive it and decode it? What, um, do, what do you think? That's, uh, that's a hard one to, to, to answer. Um, I think within the meteorological community, um, like generally, um, radio sound hunters have a, a well-received image, but of course that depends on how we all as a community behave. And um, I can't stress that enough, like there are a lot of nice people out there, but there are also some people out there who are maybe not so nice. So you need to take that into account. Um, on the side of the, of the manufacturers, um, it's difficult to, to take a look at how, how, let's say, the requirements will be there. But um, I think with the environmental concerns as well, um, there is a need that radio sounds need to be collected. But now something you also need to look at. Um, Weissala did a talk at, uh, at last year's TICO about the environmental impact of radio sounds, and they did an analysis that found that the total life cycle CO2 emission of a complete radio sound launch is like, I think, equivalent of 30 or 40 kilometer car drive. You have to maybe take these numbers with a little bit of grain of salt, as those CO2 equivalents um, always are, but that's like if we are recovering radio sounds and we're driving more than 40 kilometers, are we really doing a good job there? So in this field, um, I think there will be a little bit or there will be some movement and it's hard to, to give, a, give a good estimate on how things will go on. Well, just one minute left. Um, thank you very much. 
I hope you learned something and you had a good time. Um, yeah, enjoy day three of GPN. Consider becoming a troll. Um, the venue needs you. Thank you very much.